this working? Do I have the light pointing somewhere? Good, okay. Let's invite Josh. Hey, April. Just waiting for Josh to join in so we can get cooking and learning. I think I've invited him. Yep. How is everyone this evening? All good? Really cold. You can't see it, but I actually have a blanket with me today because it, it is quite bad. Um, just getting a bit comfortable. Hope you're all keeping warm though. It's being quite savage down here at least. I suspect the farther north than you are, the colder than it's been. Yeah, well, I mean, over there in, in on the other side of the Atlantic, I suspect it's really, really cold. Right, what is going on with you, Instagram? Let's try that again. Yeah, I think we have um, a polar sort of wind burst everywhere in Europe at the moment. So it's supposed to be pretty cold almost everywhere. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I'm not surprised. It is, it's, it's kind of going that way almost everywhere. I've started seeing actually frost on some of the windows. So it's, um, I think it's winter is actually settling in. But yeah. Oh, and there is Josh. Yay. Um, let's see if Instagram actually, Josh, I don't know if you can, I'm trying to add you, but Instagram isn't letting me. So I hope that it's letting you because otherwise this is going to be a bit awkward there we go yes go live you can do it is it working oh Hello. <laughs> Hallelujah. It kept on sending me this message like, nope, I'm not going to do it. And I'm like, why not? What's wrong with you? I'm cold <laughs> from there you go. Are you cold too? We were just talking how cold the weather has suddenly turned. Um, so... yeah. <laughs> Sorry, this bed is, is colder up there than it is down here. So I hope you're all keeping warm. I, I was saying I have my blanket secretly hiding. <laughs> that wasn't too bad. For me, anyway. <laughs> That's yeah. good. I mean, also, where I'm, I'm sitting right next to one of the biggest windows, so like the draft is is kind of quite severe. So there you uh, go. Okay. Uh, but yeah, cool. Okay, well, you are here. Instagram is working. So um, if you are ready to start this party, then let's get going. Uh, okay. Let me turn my camera off because. I thought I had it in a good position. But I obviously haven't. You're you're still in like t-shirt kind of weather. Oh my god! Like I don't know how you can do it. Honestly, uh, I live in t-shirts. <laughs> um, nope, not for me. Right, let me see if I don't want it. Bear me. There we are. Nice. Okay. Excellent. Well, I can't wait to see how this turns out because I've had visions of it in my dreams for at least two days. But anyway, very quick introduction for those of you who may not know who we are, what we're doing, um, or for those of you who are watching this later. This is our third episode in our Food History and Cooking series. I am Lily and this is Josh who will be cooking for us tonight and run us through what we're cooking, Josh. Uh, I am doing a leftover turkey curry. Because Thanksgiving. That's, yes. <laughs> that's that's why, guys. This is this is what we're doing. So 
Um, just a quick recap, the entire um, uh, sessions of, of this series have all been about food history, making food history accessible to everyone out there for you to connect with food, learn a bit about where it comes from, what it means, why it is important, and also for you to learn how to cook these bizarre, perhaps, recipes and to do it in an affordable way, but also in a way that is accessible for anyone at any level in any kitchen. So all of the things that we give you for every single recipe and that we cook should be things that you should be able to essentially just put together um, no matter where you are, at least in the UK, because we know roughly that all of these things are easily available and hopefully in the vast majority um, of, of the West and other places. So there you go. And tonight, as it is the holidays, we are doing a leftover um, turkey curry. So we will be talking about turkey and curry today is the simple as <laughs> that. And Josh will be running us through this delicious recipe. So before we get into the nitty gritty of the history, the dish and whatnot, I'm passing it over to Josh to tell us what we need for tonight and how we're starting to cook this. Uh, so you need obviously some turkey, um, which is pretty obvious. Um, but well, I, I, haven't get, I haven't got any leftover turkey, so I'm just using some uh, turkey steaks I found at Tesco's. That's which are like quick fry. Uh, you need one onion, one red pepper, one green pepper. You need some chili flakes, some turmeric, some uh, gram masala, coconut milk, and some tin tomatoes. There you go. And some, uh, olive oil and some salt and pepper. Oh, and seasoning. Course, for those of you who are vegetarian or vegan, you can use tofurkey or tofu or yes, turkey. Yeah. Essentially, you know, or, or the, uh, have loads of vegetables, you know, broccoli and stuff like that. Yeah, we're, oh, we're not imposing the, the turkey on you necessarily. It's just essentially because it's traditional Thanksgiving. Um, but yeah. anyway, now that we know what we need to cook this meal, let's dive in. So take us through the steps, Josh. What, so, what, what does this look like? So first, uh, if you got raw turkey like I have, you obviously go and cook that first. Then you're going to add your onions and peppers at the same time. Then you're going to add, oh, you need garlic and ginger to add stuff like that. Um, you, then you're going to add like all your spices, your garlic ginger all in. Uh, then you're going to add cocoa milk and your tin tomatoes. Seems pretty um, simple. It's going to take about 15, 20 minutes probably to cook. Is that That's all? really cool. Yeah. Amazing. And obviously... You can serve it with rice or whatever. I've got a couple of naan breads in the oven, which I'm not going to cook rice today. But That's fair. Yeah. Excellent. So as it's going to take us so little time to do it today, we're at a speedy space. Um, you want to get get cooking now or shall I start doing some talking and then some cooking? Up to you. Uh, it's up to you. Um, yeah, I won't be able to see any comments when I'm cooking, so um, you might have to keep going okay. in chat. But, let's uh, uh, if you're... do half and half. I'll start telling you guys about turkey, and then we will start cooking, and then you will find out more about why curry and what curry means. And hello, Francisco Castillo. Thanks a lot for joining us. Right, so well, starting today with um, the history of turkey and why turkey, um, and even though I said earlier, you know, turkey is actually quite popular for Thanksgiving and other holidays. Actually, I was just reading a study before we started doing this that shows that in this day and age, uh, only about 30 percent of families in the United States have turkey for Thanksgiving every single year. So it seems that it's, it's changing, uh, which is fair enough. But you will all probably be wondering, where do turkeys come from? What, what happened? Where, where do these animals appear from? And they are actually wild animals from uh, from the United States and from Central and South America. Uh, they were originally domesticated in the area of uh, Mexico. And we think it was either the Aztecs or precursors to the Aztecs that actually domesticated these animals. And they were particularly prominent in Aztec culture. They had different names for them. For the male turkey, they used to call them, <clears throat> excuse my Aztec pronunciation, capture that. <laughs> I'll, I'll type it later if you want. And for the female turkey, they call it totolin. But we know that other Native American tribes actually had different names for turkey. But it seems that the most 
common name one was Nem, N-E-H-M. So there you go. That is the name of the turkey. Now, in Aztec culture, the turkey represented things like fertility, fecundity, and many other things that had to do with essentially the cycle of life. And we know that it was so important that as of uh, 1430, the Lord of Texcoco required a total of 100 turkeys per day. Like, do the maths. That's like 36,500 turkeys a year. That's, that's a lot of turkeys. Um, but on top of that, we know that um, the Emperor Montezuma actually took turkeys as tribute quite regularly. So they must have been a very important part of society and the community. So from their humble origins in um, Mexico and, and the southwest of America, which is mostly what it was domesticated, it, it took from there. And in the rest of America, particularly in the northern states and in Canada, Turkey, Turkey was still sort of used as part of their common meals and whatnot, but it wasn't properly domesticated. So the majority of those turkeys would have just been wild animals. And for those of you who have never seen a wild turkey and are wondering how the hell does that look like? Well, it is kind of a bit like a pheasant, so probably very different from the turkey that you're used to seeing these days. And I will explain you why in just a moment. Where does the name Turkey come from? Because everyone thinks, well, it comes from from the country Turkey itself. Uh, what, what is the relationship? Like, what happened there? Well, it has indeed a relationship with Turkey itself. What happens is that when uh, the Spanish conquistadors arrive to America and they colonize everything, as they did, they bring a lot of stuff with them. If you've been listening to our previous sessions, we have spoken already about a few of them. Pumpkin was one of them, for example. Uh, but Turkey was one of the most important things that uh, Spanish traders actually brought from the New World. It was the most successful type of produce. Now, through the Spanish trade in the Mediterranean, the Ottoman Empire, which is modern day Turkey and surrounding areas, acquired these birds. And the Ottomans by this stage were actually really, really well accustomed to dealing with birds, other Asian birds like chickens and other type of fowls. So they started breeding turkeys to make them a bit more plump and make them essentially dumber and more domesticated so they wouldn't be difficult to handle and so they could grow them in masses. And that is how Turkey actually gets started as a sort of meat industry in, in Europe and, and in this part of the, uh, of the world, really. Um, the, the name, though, causes a lot of confusion. And we know that the different names in different European languages used for Turkey um, during this time period um, sometimes confuse it with peacock. Uh, a great example is in Spanish. We call turkey pavo, and peacock is called uh, pavo real, like royal turkey, because <laughs> <laughs> of the feathers and whatnot. Um, so there is lots of issues. Um, there was also a possible case of misidentification of the turkey originally with the Guinean fowl. So lots of language problems yet once again, like seemingly with everything that we cook. <laughs> but there you go. And and again, the origin of Turkey and how different languages end up with not Turkey as a word in, in their language to refer to this animal also has to do with who brought Turkey to their country. In the case of France and Italy, um, the, the actual words associated with Turkey are usually uh, relating to India. So it's like something like an Indian cock or an Indian chicken or something like that. But in England, it is Turkey because it was brought to the UK in the 16th century by Turkish merchants. So that is the reason why we call it Turkey, um, because that's where it came from, apparently, <laughs> even though obviously it came from the US. Well, why did Turkey become so successful in Europe? Um, like I said, it's a very big bird, or at least bigger than a lot of other birds that people here would have been used to. Um, and it's very showy. In case you have never seen a proper turkey, like live, you know, walking around, it, it's, it's quite a colorful bird, and it's, it's big, and it's, it's just a lot of it. So when you put it on a kitchen table, it just looks awesome. And it just took over all of the European Renaissance cuisine. Um, on top of that, and even though it's not very tasty, the turkeys had a great uh, thing at their favor that they had a great appearance. So it looked like you had a lot of money and a lot of meat, but turkeys are very cheap to, to raise. So it was an easy investment, essentially, for people to start growing turkeys and having turkey farms. Now, the fun part of the story is that the turkey somehow manages to do a complete 360 and make its way back to America. And the process is essentially through Thanksgiving. Now, by the time the colonists from England arrive and make the Plymouth colony in the area of Massachusetts, um, they had seen turkeys, the European turkeys. 
they go there, they start having this celebration <laughs> with Native Americans, and they see a bird that to them seems familiar, the wild turkey. Now remember, I've explained at the beginning, this looks more like a pheasant, and these guys were used to, you know, our vision of the turkey, right? More importantly, the wild turkey is not a domesticated animal. So to them, it just looked like a ravaging chicken, completely crazy, going around, picking everything, and, and they just hated it. So they got so crossed about the fact that this turkey did not live up to the expectations that they started importing turkey from Europe to America. <laughs> to the point that even to date, the vast majority of the turkey that is consumed and grow and bred in the United States is of European breeds even though they have it right there. So there you go, that's how it happened. They essentially just wanted dumber turkeys that they could eat, easy. Well, it's just as good because given the popularity of turkey, it actually started having a, a well, a too much of an overtake in the meat market of, of birds and whatnot. And by the 1800s, while turkeys are actually being overhunted, the population is to start to being quite compromised. So it caused a real issue. And it's because by Victorian times, turkey has become such a popular bird in every single table, whether poor or rich, that it's actually become the number one holiday meal, not just for Thanksgiving, but for Christmas, both in the US, in the UK, and in other parts of Europe. And we actually have a wonderful documentation of this on a very popular story that probably many of you are familiar with, which is in Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. So if you've ever read Char uh, Charles Dickens or perhaps in a movie adaptation or whatnot, you may notice that for the actual Christmas meal, Bob Cratchit has a goose, which was the traditional bird normally for celebrations in most of Europe and particularly in the UK. But when Scrooge actually arrives to the, to the house of Cratchit, they remove the goose away and they put a turkey because turkey was the ultimate symbol of festivity and of having good meat and a good time. And that's how the turkey essentially took over the world. Now, unfortunately, humans have exploited the way the turkey is used, perceived and consumed to the point that it's actually caused a lot of problems. So like I said, the breeding started um, by the Turkish people in the Ottoman Empire as far back as the late 15th, early 16th century. Now, fast forward that, all of that until the 21st century, that's like over five, year, five centuries of breeding and genetical mutations and whatnot. Because turkey is quite a showy bird, people just kept on trying to make them bigger and, and more showier. And particularly for cooking, um, you know, the most valuable part of the turkey is the breast. So they just wanted big chested tur turkeys, essentially. By the 80s, turkeys were so fat at the breast that they couldn't sustain themselves. And with this, I mean, they couldn't actually walk without breaking their legs. So we had a serious problem with the way turkeys were being used and, and the way turkeys were living. And you would think any sensible human being would have stopped breeding turkeys at that stage to give them these problems. But no, instead we just decided, or at least scientists and breeders decided, not what we were going to do was going to make even dumber, chunkier turkeys by giving them thicker legs. And that's, that's how the turkey keeps on getting bigger every single year, because in order to compensate for the amount of meat, flavorless meat a lot of the time that they put in, they, they just need to make the rest of it bigger. But they only caught on to it just a few years ago. So that is the very sort of strange, bizarre history of the turkey and why it's so popular for the holidays, particularly for Thanksgiving and for Christmas, and why we thought it was quite uh, appropriate to make a leftover turkey uh, curry. So now that you know more about this, Josh is gonna start cooking and tell I you am? how to make this turkey into something delicious. So over to you, Josh. Hey, can you, yeah, you see it okay? Yes, yes. Now I'm Maybe not gonna be able to read any comments, so you might need to. Um... That's fine. I'll, I'll keep Sorry. an eye out on the comments. I am loving this green pan, by the way. This is it amazing. Walk. I'm walking everything tonight. <laughs> nice. Uh, nice. Uh, olive oil straight in. It's already preheated. Um, let me see. Right. Yep. Yeah, um, turkey. Straight in. I, I take it, do you keep that olive oil quite uh, high up in terms of temperature? Like. That I can start. Do, do we keep the oil quite hot whilst we're cooking the turkey, I take it? like, Or do we put it at medium heat? 
Uh, it's on medium at the moment, but it was on about five minutes before the live, so the pan's right. very hot. Right. So, yeah, we just want to, you know, follow the, um, cook it for about two, three minutes. Um, now, if you are got leftover turkey, you will cook the onions and peppers before the turkey, then you'll add the turkey in after. Because this is raw, it needs more cooking time. So. Yes. yes. Timing is very important when you're doing these things. Yes. So, Yep, make sure that it doesn't get dry. Make sure that you have plenty of juice to keep it moving and cooking. Because yes. otherwise, this turkey will um, not go there. Hello, everyone that's just joining us. Thank you so much for joining. We're just showing you how we're cooking our turkey curry for Thanksgiving. Yeah, so that's almost um, ready to add the peppers in now. Um, Excellent. So the next step is yeah. the onions. So the onions and peppers, which I have already preached up, Pre because I'm old enough. <laughs> so <laughs> I've just fried the onions, quite thin, and the peppers are quite chunky, uh, red and green. Uh, yeah, I'm going to cool. throw them in now. Don't need about five minutes or so to cook. Before you start yeah. adding everything else, just to soften them basically. You don't want to brown it anything at the moment. So you don't want to like, you know, colour the turkey or anything. So, um, so it's yeah, still so, fairly golden colours rather than browning. Yeah. Yeah. So in a chef's term, it's called sweating, which is cooking without colour. Um, I had never heard that. That's very interesting. Yeah. It's like you normally like sweat the onions and that, but that, so you get you sort of cook cooking, cooking without colours, basically. Cool. Yeah. Then I've got all my her, her spices in here. So I've got garlic, ginger, uh, garlic masala, and Indian turmeric, which it's I've had for years, and chili flakes. Um, I'm putting um, a half a teaspoon of chili in because most of my family don't like chili, so yeah. Um, I'm so doing it a little bit more. Just if you like it a bit more spicy, you can put a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you can always add like some fresh chilies on top for garnish in it if you want to. If you like a bit more kick to it, so um, yeah. So we're going to I'm going to give that a couple of minutes. I'm just going to put a lid on it. Cause... And, uh, yeah, that's going to be cooking nicely. I'll turn around to my face. Cool. That's cooking. Excellent. <laughs> Brilliant. And can you tell us why do we put the lid on top of the of the wok or the pot whilst we're waiting for things to cook? Um, Because all the steam doesn't stay escape, so obviously it gets hotter, so it cooks faster. Uh, basically, um, so if you need cooking something quickly, always put a lid on. Um, but you need, obviously, you need to watch it, make sure it's not burning. Um, but, so. Obviously, because we've only got so long on the live, yes. this makes it a little yes, bit we, quicker. Uh, we take all the shortcuts that we can, but that's <laughs> please send food. <laughs> Well, it, it may get to you a bit, um, I don't know, a bit soggy or, or a bit decomposed, but we can try it. I mean, it's a, it's a long way. Well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, Blue School Studios is all the way in the United States, so ah, um, okay. I'm on the on the West Coast, so it will take a little while to get in there. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I can't really preserve it for that long, I don't think. <laughs> and I think customs sure. might be. Take yeah, interesting. What what are these people sending you? A, a turkey curry? Okay, uh, bizarre. 
Well, whilst this is cooking, I'll get you guys started on the actual history of curry and what is the deal behind curry. Because even even as someone who knows a fair bit about curry, because I, I love curry, um, or, or at least, well, all of the variants of curry, um, okay. I, I knew a fair bit about its history, but it can be quite confusing. And I thought one of the first things I needed to do for you guys today was kind of outline a bit more what, what do we mean with curry, where does it come from and whatnot. So I'll start with that. So, like I said, it has quite a complicated history, but the, the most important thing about um, curry to, to understand from the beginning is the origin of the word. Curry comes to us from the uh, Tamil word. Uh, the Tamil are a group of people in the South Indian continent, um, which is kari, K-A-R-I, okay? And it essentially means sauce or gravy. Um, I guess the, the closest thing to this curry that we would have in European cuisine is something like a ragout or like a hot pot, just so you get an idea in terms of thickness and, and in terms of the concept, right? But to make things more complicated, we don't just have this curry. We have the curry plant, the curry tree leaves, and of course we have curry powder. Now curry powder, uh, because we've already told you a bit more about it as we were cooking, is that mix um, of spices that Josh had on, on the plate. In, in the UK and the vast majority of the Western world, you can buy it pre-made and you can actually nowadays in it, it, it used to be made, there you go, it used to be made by families and you would just like stash it and it will keep, like Josh said, it would keep forever and ever and ever because those things, you know, don't really go, go off. Now, the key um, spices that you have in curry powder normally there are some exceptions, but normally they are turmeric, cumin, coriander, um, chilies, crushed chilies, and something called uh, fenugreek. And only sometimes curry powder has curry leaves. Mind you, there isn't even actual curry anything in your curry powder, just, just so you know, or it doesn't have to be. Um, this type of spice mixture um, usually is called a masala. In, in the Indian subcontinent. That's the reason why in the shop, when you, go to buy, when you go to buy it, you have this garam masala. If you can't see curry powder, as in labeled curry powder, and you see garam masala, that's essentially what you want. Um, it's the same thing. Um, so how do we go from all of these things into, into one idea of curry, or, or where does this originate from? Well, coming back to the Tamil people, the Brahmin Tamil from Madhu, um, were and um, are actually strict vegetarians. So for them, a curry would have been literally um, a vegetable sauce gravy dish um, with these spices and a dash of coconut, which is the, the most traditional sort of thickener in the Indian subcontinent. And that's how the vast majority of these curries would um, be cooked. Now, the earliest records that we have of these spices that I've just mentioned, those ones. Add all this in now? Perfect. So I'm, add, I'm adding all the spices in now. There we go. So those spices that we're talking about, the very first instance that we have of them being used to make meals and make these curry meals are actually from ancient Babylonian tablets dating from about 1700 BC, give or take. And from the archaeological perspective, we do have evidence of residues of these mixed spices used in kitchens and in homesteads um, in the area of the Indus Valley, uh, in particular two main cities, which are Harpata and uh, Mohenjo Doro, which are currently in the area of Pakistan. But please remember that Pakistan and India used to be the same country. Um, so it is still the Indian subcontinent and it would still be Indian culture. So that's the, the main origin of, of these dishes and how things um, started moving on from. Now, and I need everyone to understand this, there was never such a thing as a curry dish in the whole Indian subcontinent. Like they did not have something called a curry. This is, this is a complete invention of the British, essentially. For those of you who don't know, the British used to rule over India for quite some time. It was part of the colonies. So the curry was essentially British appropriation and misrepresentation of a very diverse, very varied Indian cuisine. Now here Just comes the tomatoes. Tomatoes now, yeah. Excellent. Uh, we, 
obviously, you know, when people in India started doing curries and, and things like this, they wouldn't have had tomatoes. They came from America. So, you know, think, think of all of the subtexts of British imperialism. Now, what essentially happens is that during British rule of India, uh, there was a specific type of people who, who really uh, spent a long time there and for whom the, the trade price was very important. This was the workers of the East India Company, which were essentially um, a company created by the British government to control all the trade and spice that was coming from originally America and eventually um, India and, and the rest of the Pacific sort of area. Now, these workers would have been fed thousands and hundreds of different of Indian dishes, all of them with their individual names, some of which may seem familiar to you nowadays, like a balti, like a kurma, things like that. But they essentially just grab them all into one category and call them curry and rice dishes. This, this whole thing with the rice as well is particularly annoying because, again, they kind of threw everything on the rice where they were actually referring to hundreds of different types of rice dishes, such as pilau, to, to say one of the most popular ones. But again, it would have been the same story with the rice. Anything that had rice in it, it was a rice thing that you had with curry. So, I've got my intentions with me now. Huh? Oh, there we go, Benny. <laughs> He's uh, helping me. Benny also wants some, some turkey curry. <laughs> um, I believe this is the way forward. Um, so going back to this whole rice issue, um, for the vast majority of the Indian subcontinent, eating something like what we're cooking today with rice is actually not very common. Uh, the tradition of having a, a rice base for a curry. Sorry, I know I keep on doing this, but it's just so we understand. We're using very modern concepts. Um, it's, it's actually a very South Indian and Bengali tradition. The vast majority of India would probably use roti or some form of bread-like um, item to go with their curry. So... It's, it's not even representative of the whole of India. It's representative of a very specific part of India. As it happens sometimes, you know, we do these reductionisms. So these workers from the East India Company um, start returning um, to the UK in drip drops and they bring that type of nostalgia of, oh, when I was in India, I ate all of these wonderful dishes, curries, um, and the 18th century, and they start trying to replicate that at home. Now, even though obviously spice and goods from India are traveling to main um, to the main heart of the empire in England, not everything was readily available. So they tried to cook that as whatever they could in, in the UK. So new recipes start essentially being made, like what we're doing today, this completely random Thanksgiving turkey curry, right? And this is how the, this concept of curry starts emerging. The first actual um, recipe that we have in the UK that calls something a curry, as we know it, dates from 1747, so the middle of the 18th century, and it's from a lass called Hannah Glass or Hannah Glasse, depending um, where you're from, and it's literally called a curry the Indian way. So suggesting that this is the right way of doing it, not the way other people are doing it. There was quite a level of elitism in, in this whole story and... Well, it gets confusing. But in any case, this is the first official curry, the Indian way recipe that we have in the UK. Now, from this moment on, in the 18th century, the curry starts uh, catching on to society. More people from India, more, more East India Company workers start coming back to the UK. And of course, as we enter the Victorian period, um, cookbooks become really popular, more recipes start appearing, more variations, and this whole myriad of curry um, essentially becomes part of British culture, um, which is, you know, is, is, is funny if you think about it, because it has this strong association with India, even though curry, K-A-R-I, is not just an Indian thing, it can be a <laughs> Thai, it can be part of a lot of the um, islands that go into I Indonesia. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's not just Indian, but it has this specifically Indian um, concept around it. But in truth, it isn't a British invention. 
pastisse or, or a British borrowing, if you like. It's definitely something that has evolved and, and emerged throughout time. Now, the fun part of the story is that as the 19th century progresses and the 20th century progresses too, and the British Empire keeps on, on gathering wealth or, or starts decomposing, migrants from the sub-Indian continent start arriving to the UK. And they find all of these curries. And they're like, what? <laughs> this is not <laughs> what we call this food or whatever. But instead of trying to actually demystify this construction that has been happening for nearly over two centuries about their own food and culture, they, they actually come to the inevitable conclusion that it was easier to play along with the British curries and essentially just let, let the British curry be a British curry that Indian people cook and adjust their own taste, flavors, recipes, and whatnot to the British curry taste and indeed create the curries that you probably know these days. That is actually how this curry comes to your table because it was easier to play along than actually fight the tide and try to explain how British colonialism had completely misrepresented and appropriated Indian culture. There you go. That's, that's how it happens, um, which I'm sure is probably a bit soul crushing. Um, but, but, you know, in, in a way, it's essentially just, yeah, it's, it's, it's what happens. It, it doesn't get understood properly. It doesn't get translated properly. And it becomes kind of an entity of its own right, um, which is the important bit to understand. You know, it's, a, a curry can be almost any stewy like thing that has certain spices. It doesn't have to be the same spices everywhere. So it's it's a very versatile dish. It's a very elevated dish as well because you can almost do anything with it. I mean, look what we're doing today, right? It's it's very simple. It's very quick to make, and um, and it has uh, the best part about a curry. And I mean, Josh can probably agree with me or not. I don't know. I think is that. You don't only taste a curry, you can smell a curry, you can see it, you know, it's very colorful. Yeah. So it's very attractive for humans, you know, for our brains, which are very visual. This is a very, um, you know, enticing food. We're going to want to see it, eat it, smell it, consume it. So that's why it really caught on to these people from the East India Company so quickly, because they probably hadn't seen anything like this before. And it was like a, an attack on their senses. So they were completely curry struck <laughs> um but yeah that's that's the history of the curry now a couple of things and and facts that are a bit more random that i want you to know about curry just so you understand the full circle and and how sort of interesting and weird this appropriation or new invention if you like is um the one of the most popular curries in the uk not all of you may know it because it's, it's quite particularly popular here in the UK, is something called a vindaloo. Um, you can almost find it in every single curry house or in every single restaurant that is Indian in the UK. Now, a vindaloo isn't even an Indian recipe in origin. Vindaloo comes from a Portuguese meal, uh, which is essentially called, and excuse my Portuguese because my pronunciation isn't very good, is carne de viña de alhos which literally means uh, meat that is on a garlic marinara. So marinated meat and garlic, essentially. And then Indian people um, took this as part of the um, Portuguese colonies that started emerging in the area of, of India where they started doing their trade, particularly in the area of Goa, and they developed their own curry, which then was brought here to the UK and became an absolute success. But originally, it was actually a Portuguese meal, not an Indian meal at all. Another thing is that the vast majority of Indian curry places <laughs> in the UK are actually run by people from Bangladesh. So they are only Indian in, I'm, I'm even reluctant to say ethnicity or, or cultural background. Because obviously they're, you know, in the Indian subcontinent, the whole area between Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, and everything else, there are lots of political, social, and religious tensions. So it's never good to generalize. But again, it comes from the same sort of geographic area. And please consider that Bangladesh was only formed as a country in 1971. So 
for the vast majority of what the British Empire and British people would have known at the time, Bangladeshi people were actually of Indian origin. Uh, but in, in the UK, the vast majority of, of these restaurants are actually run from people, uh, by people from Bangladesh, which also causes a problem because in the same way that this concept of rice with curry is kind of like intrinsically related in our mind, the vast majority of the meals that you may be seeing in a lot of the traditional curry places reflect that Bangladeshi sort of background rather than the more holistic um, cultural representation of India as a very big and, and varied country. So just keep that in mind when you go eating or when you're ordering that you're actually experiencing just a fraction of Indian cuisine. Um, even though it is authentic, it's just a small part. India is a really, really large country and the Indian subcontinent is even bigger. So just keep that in mind, essentially, and um, don't generalize <laughs> and call everything a curry because otherwise we're going to end up having this very uh, strange perpetuation of, of a myth for a very, very long time. And that is how turkey and curry meet together by British people deciding they knew better, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> Today is a, a historical tale of colonization, I'm afraid. But there you go. It's, it's the sad truth of the things that we eat. You know, it, it happens. We, we go to places, we take our own stories and biases to these places, we apply them, we consume them, and we perpetuate these myths. It's unfortunate part of human history that you don't realize, but you're actually consuming it almost every day, potentially even in the things that you eat. So I hope that that helps to give you sort of a bit more of an insight of how things that you take for granted have a much more convoluted political and social cultural story behind them. And there you go. Well, this curry is looking amazing, Josh. I um, I called it curry and I'm, I'm sort of crying inside. It's almost <laughs> for, done. For generalizing, but it looks really good. I'm literally waiting for it to reduce now. And it... So how can you tell that a curry or, or any type of sort of saucy meal is reduced properly? Like, can you explain that to the people who maybe um, are watching the film? I suppose it depends on what you're doing um, and personal fitness. I mean, I went a bit heavy-handed with coconut milk, so it's quite watery, this. Um, but if you like it that way, um, have it. Um, if you want it a little bit thicker, just keep cooking until it reduces down. Um, yeah, uh, certain sauces like hollandaise, the flour will need to be a certain thickness. Mm -hmm. um, but like curry sauces, um, pasta sauces, it's unless you're like working in a restaurant and everything has to be, you know, to a certain, you know, level, um, you can still do it how you want at home. Um, so, yeah. so, so in essence, it doesn't have to have a particular consistency then for this to pass as a curry. It's, it's kind of I mean, whatever way I'm you want. I'm not a curry expert, but I pers my personal um, choice will be no, do it how you want. You know, it's, it's your food, you're cooking, so have it how you like it. You know, yeah. don't. Um, there is maybe probably a way of consistency for curries. Um, but I haven't really studied curries and you know cooked a lot of curries in my in my time. Well, I to say, um, just from what I've been reading, to be honest, given the fact that curries are essentially just made up to make them look as whatever you want, I think it's also one of the reasons why they are such a popular dish because you can kind of yeah. customize it and make it whatever you want. Um, so you know, it was it was something that I found really interesting about this thing of making curry the traditional Indian way which was that um, from what I was reading, you know, a lot, of the uh, a lot of the recipes that people from the East India Company would have experienced back in India, there wouldn't have been, you know, recipes like you would find in a book, everything to the millimeter. It would have been a lot more similar to what we do here, sort of a bit on the spot, or a lot similar to what you guys may do at home, you know. No, no one single curry, even though you may have had the same ingredients, would have come exactly the same way because... You're always trying to perfect it or, you know, things don't go exactly the same way every single day. That onion may have been a bit more crunchy. The coconut milk may have been a bit less, a bit more. 
So it's, I think it's one of the beauties about this type of dish that is quite freeing, it's quite creative. Um, and you can sort of just like, oh, look at that. That looks gorgeous. I mean, if I had some fresh coriander, I'd probably sprinkle that on top, but I don't have any, which I thought I did. But um, yeah, just, just a bit of presentation wise. But yeah, I've got just some lamb bread, so I'm dip it in and um, stuff. Um, Is it which just a normal naan bread, or does it have garlic mm. or spices, anything? Just a normal one, these ones. But um, peshwari will probably be quite nice for this. Um, I love me a peshwari naan. Or, or even garlic, garlic and cheese one would be quite nice. Um, you know, obviously pop dums. you know. Uh, I, know I would normally serve rice with curry as well, but... Um, yeah, that is it done really. Um, That's fair. Ooh, yeah. on, on the subject of naan, particularly if you live in the UK, and I suspect it's probably quite similar in the US and potentially other places um, in, in Europe, such as Germany or whatever. If you truly want to have the most delicious naan, don't go and buy it in the supermarket. The vast majority of main towns will probably have, um, I mean, in the UK are called ethnic shops it's terrible what this should really be is you know international food shops food shops that represent a particular nation a particular culture or tradition in the uk we have a lot of food and, and stores from places such as india or places such as you know turkey the middle east uh, central asia whatever if you go to one of those stores a lot of them would have their own tandoori and you can buy actually fresh naan on the oh, day, wow. which is delicious and usually tends to be very cheap. So in the same way that you would go there and probably find these spices a lot fresher and a lot tastier, you know, don't be shy. Actually engage with the people who can show you how to cook these very well. I'm very lucky that here in Southampton, in the area of St. Mary's, we have a very, very large um, uh, Persian community and Afghan community. So I, I go to the butchers there, actually, and they have their own tandoori, and I can buy a fresh naan that is literally like this big, mm. I kid you not, and it, it will generally make the experience for this um, much different. Um, so, you know, uh, whenever you can, try and buy from, from the places where the food actually comes from, not just because you will get better quality, but because you may even, you know, learn something about it, um, which is yeah. always good. Now, Josh, it's time for our review. So on a scale of one to five, as usual, what do you think about this curry? I have to say, this is my first time ever making this curry. Never made it before. Um, I'm probably going to give it a four. It, it just tastes really lost, after I'm really surprised. <laughs> a whole mighty uh, four. Mm. This is... Uh, Guys, in case you haven't seen the previous episodes, Josh is actually quite judgmental with the things he cooks. And this is the pe the first solid four that he has um, given to anything that has passed through the series. So there we go. Now I really want to try it. <laughs> it looks amazing. Well, you got the recipe. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, considering that it's so quick to make, like I, I yeah. generally... I, I always get a bit concerned about making things like that from scratch because I think they're going to take a really long time. But um, having seen it happening so fast, uh, I think I would probably be quite quite willing to sort of give it a go. I mean, you, know. you probably could slow cook this if you wanted to as well. So back all in a slow cooker. And just, you know, a bit. you know, turn on and you'll be ready to you come home or whatever. So, That's yeah. fair. And you'll probably get a lot more flavour as well in a slow cooker. Yeah, I mean, um, particularly with, you know, this is the thing, turkey. I'm not the biggest turkey fan just because of the flavor. I'm not, thing. no. But, but, I mean, in, in a curry, then I guess the, the least of your worries is, is flavor. Um, mm. Grand, Gangrel underscore UK says it does look good. Uh, and I know yeah. he's a big um, curry fan and a big Peshwari uh, Nan fan. So there you go. Uh, I have to say, this is probably the best meal I've cooked live, so. Well, there you yeah. go. We're, we're getting we're getting that progression. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, out of interest, our mushroom dish. Um, what we did, mm -hmm. we went to 
do you know the mushrooms we did on our first live? Yeah. We, we went to a restaurant today, me and Sally, and she ordered garlic mushrooms. And I was a spitty image of the ones I cooked here. Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Whether they watched it, robbed it, or, you know. Well. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, that, we, that was, uh, they looked identical to the ones I did, so. We'd have to do some investigation. Yeah. Oh, Safe Engine. Oh, hi, Safe Engine Studies. I didn't see you popping up. I think I was um, talking when this was happening. Um, this was amazing. Thank you so much for hosting and sharing. Looks amazing. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. It, it definitely, I, I wish I could almost feel the, the smell through the screen. Um, uh, but no. if, if I could send you some down, I would. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it did taste very really nice, actually. Awesome. Well, but, there's a lot of room to add more heat as well if you like your heat. Uh, like I've just, I pull up a few fresh chilies and stuff more. Just to get them. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do like a bit of heat in curry. I think as well because, you know, coconut milk can be quite sweet. It's It can yeah. be very easy to sort of um, um, go go a bit too hard on mm. that side. Uh, so I suspect that putting, you know, a, a good... I'm going to be... Mm. I'm going to... Throw caution out of the window and not even say half uh, a chili, but a whole chili in there would probably make this particularly. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I use um, half a teaspoon of chili flakes rather than a yeah. tablespoon because uh, my wife doesn't like chili. And the kid, um, Izzy's not a massive chili fan. So. No, I mean, I, I think, to be fair, when I was younger, chili wasn't really my, my favourite thing in the world either. So I think no. it's definitely an acquired taste. No. There you go. Well, um, yeah. guys, if you have any questions, please pop them on the chat or on the question box. Yeah. Um, otherwise, if, we're... Have you got any recommendations for what you want to see next month as well? So... Yes. I was just going to say that. Remember to send us your pictures if you make this at home. Um, and the next one, and the last one for now at least, will be Christmas. We will be on, on the 22nd of December to cook something Christmas related. Um, obviously, like last time, we cannot have a whole Christmas meal done in one yeah, hour. Yeah, we can't do a whole <laughs> break in the life. So. <laughs> it may be a bit well, ambitious. I'm, I'm thinking maybe a, uh, a starter, maybe a cheese starter or something. Ooh, that would be nice. Yeah, I, I think... Some people like green cranberry or something. That's good. I like the sound um, of it. See, but yeah, that's that what I'm thinking. But let us know what you guys want to see. Cause, yeah. It's it's always <laughs> more fun if, if we know what you want to cook because then mm. we can cook it together. But yeah, the, the Christmas one is going to be very interesting for me because, mm. well, Christmas traditions, particularly around food, are very different in Spain, where I come from, than in the UK. Um, and I've never had proper Christmas meal here, apart from once, and it wasn't the greatest experience of my life. So <laughs> I'm going to be very much looking forward to see what we can do to redeem. I'll be honest, our Christmas dinner is overrated. It's um, like yeah, it was, oh, I'm not a massive fan of a like, the traditional Christmas dinner. It was, it was a bit of a letdown for me, but oh well. Yeah. We, shall, we shall see what we can come up with. Um, Thank you. This was wonderful. Thank you, April, for being here. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, thank you, everyone else. Thanks a lot for the comments. Um, sorry mm -hmm. that we couldn't send you uh, the turkey curry all the way to uh, California and everywhere else. Uh, but <laughs> thanks so much, guys. And I but guess you, we'll see you, you know how to cook it now. So. Yes, exactly. So you, you now can know cook, how to cook. You can go out and cook it yourself now. And send us pictures. So. Yes. Definitely yeah. send us. Um, We'd definitely love to Ooh. see something from an African country. We oh. have a potential something in the making, so... Um, oh, no, don't, don't say that. I'm I'll never... I'll keep you uh, I've, I've never cooked African food. I've, I've so. still worry. I, I have something in mind, but that is for the new year. And, yeah, we'll see you guys on the 22nd of December uh, for some Christmas special. Thank you so much, and have a lovely evening. Yep. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye.